I'm Stephen Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. I've spent the past week hunting and fishing deep in the jungles of central Bolivia and South America. My guides are Patrick and Federico of Angling Frontiers, who lead fishing expeditions up this remote stretch of river to pursue the prized Golden Dorado. But my real teachers on this adventure have been the crew of native Chamane men who we hired to help us make the journey. For them, hunting is more than a lifestyle. It's a matter of survival. And observing them has challenged some of my own personal taboos, such as poisoning fish, and hunting and eating primates. There is no meat parallel to that. But witnessing those things firsthand has opened my mind to an entirely new notion of what it means to be a modern day hunter. Now, I've headed into the jungle with Marco and Alberto, two of the most seasoned hunters in our group. We're out night hunting with flashlights. For the Chimane, it's the preferred way of hunting mammals. Though in my native land, it's a practice that is largely illegal. Not long after we got started, Ow. I got nailed on the ankle by a bullet ant, which equates to an hour of pure misery, God, followed by an hour of your standard sucky kind of misery. But Marco treated the bite with a local anesthetic, and eventually the pain subsided enough that I could press on. The cacophony of the jungle at night is deafening and also confusing. It sounds like we're surrounded by animals, but all we see is the occasional rustle of leaves where they've been. We catch a few glimpses of mysterious critters and get a good look at a regular old possum. No comment? But for whatever reason, these animals are ignored by the Chimane. I think these guys are looking for bigger, meatier game. Of course, I cannot ask them outright. The one language we have in common, Spanish, none of us can actually speak very well. We've been gradually learning how to communicate with gestures, but there's still plenty that I do not understand. <laughs> Oh. I just got yelled at, I think. Oh, oh, now I'm gonna yell at it again. Oh, 
Okay. Rocket deer, deer of the jungle. I had no idea what was going on, but I saw Marco get kind of excited and move forward with the shotgun. And he shot, and it sounded like something huge going down. And I now see that he hit the deer with buckshot, but only hit it in the nose area, so it was confused, but hardly mortally wounded. It's cool that I have my bow handy to help them finish it off because they treat shotgun shells like bars of gold. They do not waste shotgun shells. <laughs> it's nice to have my bow because I feel that they like relate to me as a hunter more and are, seem very willing to show me stuff and take me seriously. Back at camp, Marco and Alberto begin to butcher the brocket deer at the edge of the river. I lend a hand, and it's obvious to me that the differences in our approach to hunting are not limited to what happens before the kill. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of deer cut up. I've never seen one cut up quite like this. When they gutted the deer in the field, they gutted it from the diaphragm back. So you take out the organs that, that you know, sour quickly and leave all the edible stuff forward. And then he just pulled all the other parts out, the heart, lung, liver out, and then beheaded and quartered the deer high down. But it's a good learning experience. I'm just curious to see how this is gonna play out. It's interesting that you have um, so many like do's and don'ts. And just don't do this and don't do that when you're cutting up meat. But all these things, you're like, never, ever, you know, get it all wet. It's all wet. And it's hotter than hell out. <laughs> In addition to the deer, the other guys have hand-lined a couple of Maturo catfish that we'll butcher as well. They do cut off some fillets, but for the most part, the catfish is left largely on the bone. Almost all of it is salted and stored in bags to take home. None of it goes to waste. So there's no like taking certain parts and hucking them out in the river and keeping other parts. I mean, it just all gets cooked. The next morning, the nighttime rain has carried over to dampen our breakfast. But Marco will not be deterred. He's built a shelter to cover our cooking area. When we first came out, there was this big wall, primarily between me and the guys that are around the crew, everything being separate all the time. I think through fishing together and hunting together, and then because I'm really interested in the food, it just got a lot more comfortable and a lot more loose. Look, at a time, I used to feel kind of like not real welcome, or I would come up and everybody would sort of drift away. But um, it's nice now just to be able to hang out. The deer meat, still hair on, skin on. They cut into the thick spots. You see, like, here's a back ham. They kind of splayed it open and salted it very heavily. And now it's going on this smoker rack with one catfish head. The meat will smoke all day. If I came over to some dude's house, like where I grew up in Michigan, 
and I saw that he was cooking deer like this, I'd be like, oh man, you got it all wrong, you know? And it really opens up your idea that there are many ways to do things. If the skin wasn't on there, I'd have kind of an idea of what it's gonna wind up being like. I cannot picture what it's gonna wind up being like. I'm very excited and, and intrigued by this. I can't wait to eat this. And for breakfast, took some of the deer meat, seems like some meat off the back leg, butterflied these pieces and put a lot of salt on them and deep fried them, it's very good. Wildly different diet, wildly different location, but that venison just has that great venison taste to it. Meanwhile, the catfish is being made into a stew that's similar to how the monkey was prepared. It's a big pot, and they put the catfish backbones. I think one of the heads is in there, tail, just like the scraps of the catfish. One thing you see in all the cooking, we bought a lot of it on the way up at the villages we passed, is bought tons of plantains. And they'll add that in there, and that'll wind up being as thick as porridge. It'll wind up being almost like, uh, like very thin grits. That's very good fish, man. Like, honestly, that catfish, cooked that way, tastes like grouper to me. It has the same texture and flavor and density as grouper. I would never eat that and think that that was a freshwater fish. Waiting for the deer to smoke gives us one more good opportunity to do some fishing. So Marco and I grab our bows and head to a small tributary that has the clearest water we've seen this whole trip. See? Yatarana? Sablo? Oh, Sablo. At this point, I've developed something of a rapport with my companions. The language barrier that seemed so insurmountable before now feels less daunting. We communicate pretty effectively with simple hand gestures and facial expressions, and maybe a word or two of Spanish here and there. <laughs> There's a connection now, and it's refreshing. A lot of us have gotten so far away from the land, from connections with food. It's just a wonderful experience to be able to hunt with some people who've maintained a constant intergenerational connection to the land and to hunting the same place. I'm of Italian, descent a little bit and a bunch of other stuff I don't even know. I'm not like an ancestral hunter. And things got lost during those generations and generations of my family that didn't hunt. It's a little out of my comfort zone for range right there. But I think to be able to go out with people Mark, where that chain is unbroken is, it's just like rejuvenating to me. I mean, it makes me feel so alive and grateful. After a light drizzle, the sun comes out and visibility improves. There are fish everywhere. <laughs> That's when I get my most satisfying catch of the day. That's the first one of these I've seen. They keep talking about a fish that lives here called Yatarana. Look, he's got like a piranha-like tooth. They're very popular fish to eat. These guys like them a lot. It's been an exciting afternoon and the perfect cap to the trip. Yatarana. All that's left now is to head back to camp 
and enjoy a mixed and somewhat odd collection of meat from the jungle. It's our last night in camp, and we're having a, like a banquet of sorts. We've got a ton of stuff, including the Yadarana that I arrowed. It's been heavily salted and is now resting on a grill over the fire. While we were fishing, some of the Chimane bagged a couple of large game birds that came through the forest canopy over the camp. They've got a razor-billed curacao and a crested guan. Some of it will be fried, some stewed with rice. <laughs> then, of course, there's the brocket deer, which has been smoking all day. So this is like dried meat that you bring home. You just pull pieces off it and chew them up, and it's just like smoked jerky. The food here is born of the place, literally, and also it's born of the climate. Everything is cooked well. And it has to do with the lack of refrigeration and just like a food safety thing that's come up over time. A lot of things are smoked. You know, it's like, again, like in a really hot place, a lot of humidity, things rot instantly here. You're really seeing how our own ancestors used to harvest and prepare food. If you want to get a good glimpse of what our home was like, I think you have to travel far away from our homeland to start getting a better sense of like where we came from. And this is probably the most vivid look you will get at the truly ancestral ways of cooking, like true locavorism. Everything ready, we all sit down to enjoy the fruits of our labor, and it's very satisfying knowing that everyone here contributed to this meal in some way. Ooh, that looks good, man. But what strikes me most is just how familiar the camaraderie feels. A bunch of fellas enjoying some laughs and some wild game. We could just as well be dove hunters standing around a grill in Virginia, or hog hunters at a luau in Hawaii. That's a nice fish, man. Very meaty. It's really tasty. Yeah, it's very meaty. As excited as we might get about the most exotic, distant, complicated dishes, that excitement is not any higher than what people get about this food here. The shank is super good. It's not like through all of our complexity and our wealth, we achieve some higher level of satisfaction from things. I just, I just really don't think we have. You can find the same level of happiness in much simpler ways than we have. He says that is a song about this trip. He says about how he came here to the jungle with his friends and clients, and they went out fishing and hunting and came back and chapapear the food and ate it all together in a good time. Yeah. So Patrick and Federico, I want you to thank all your guys for working so hard to help to help show us such a um, remarkable place. Ellos querían decirle a ustedes a todos muchas gracias por mostrarles este lugar tan hermoso. Muchas gracias por trabajar tan duro por ello y les agradecen muchísimo por la oportunidad de conocer esto. I like their home because all the Fish and animals taste so good. Y le encanta este lugar, su casa de ustedes, porque dice que todo tiene buen sabor, dice. Todo es rico, dice. Todo es rico. You should have pie. Thank, Thank you. you.
An exception to my earlier statement about how scenes like this play out all around the world is that the camaraderie in those cases usually carries with it an assumption that you'll at least try to meet again. Maybe next year's opening day a deer season or when the weather turns and the ducks come through. But honestly, way down here, that's just not gonna happen. I know that this trip was a rare glimpse into another way of life that I will not get again. I'm reminded of something that's known to most fishermen. It's when you tie into some huge fish and you don't even know what it is. All you really know is that you'll never land it. You try to enjoy the fight for a second or two, knowing full well the fish is gonna bust you off and you will not hear from it again. I can't escape the sense that something very similar happened down here. I wanted to get to know the Chimane, and for a good chunk of time, I had them on the line. But all along I knew it would end before I ever got a really good look. The line inevitably had to break. All that's left is to remember the feeling and be grateful that you felt it.